Okay. We still start. Great. Welcome everyone. Um, <clears throat> uh, all right, so let's call the roll. Um, I'll start just with what I've got here. Um, Commissioner Sufi? Here. Uh, Commissioner Axe is not here. Uh, Commissioner Gus? Present. Great. Uh, Commissioner Jacobs? Here. Commissioner uh, Neville? Here. Commissioner Sandino? Here. And <clears throat> that is, oh, Commissioner Beeman here. Um, before we sort of get into things, um, do we have to do anything to sort of usher, or is our is, is Commissioner Gus just like automatically promoted? Um, he will be automatically now um, a regular member uh, at this point. And um, as you mentioned, Commissioner Beeman, um, I've informed everybody, but we'll mention it in the public meeting. Um, Commissioner Busby resigned. And so Commissioner Gus becomes a regular member uh, for the term of the Commissioner Busby, which I believe goes through 2025. Okay, uh, great. So, <clears throat> um, and, and Donna or Kelly or somebody with more memory than me, when somebody leaves, do we normally sort of do a, a motion to thank them? What's, what's? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we typically do, Ezra, we do, um, uh, in fact, sometimes Elena will ask me to provide some summary of some of the things that they contributed while they were on the commission, and then they receive a letter usually. The council sends a letter to outgoing commissioners. Okay. But that's not something that we, go ahead, sorry. No, no. Uh, yes, usually we would ask for some, you know, points from the commission and obviously staff, um, and then council sends a letter. Uh, we usually try to include a certificate for serving on the commission. Okay. Um, and I think, well, I know the, the votes aren't counted, but we, we also want to thank uh, Councilman uh, Carson uh, for his contribution as well. So I just, I want to sort of follow whatever the protocol is and it just doesn't, I don't recall what it is. Okay. Great. All right, well, probably save that <clears throat> for the end of the, end of, end of the meeting then. Um, all right, the first, um, do we need to do public comment on the agenda? I probably do. Uh, yes, we do. So we need to move on to the item two, which is approval of the agenda. And we do have a um, item in case there's any public comments. Yeah. Would you like to call for a public comment? Yes, please. On Sorry. the next item. Okay. All right. Um, and we do not have any public commenters. Okay, <clears throat> moving on then. Um, can I get an emo emo uh, a motion for approval of agenda, please? Also approve. Uh, move. Seconded by Neville. Call the roll. Um, Commissioner Sufi? Aye. Aye. Commissioner uh, Gus? Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Commissioner Neville? Aye. Commissioner Sandino? Aye. Commissioner Beeman, aye. And um, all present say aye, and Axe is not present. Okay, we're on to um, brief announcements from staff. Um, other than actually mentioning that uh, Commissioner Busby is off, which I've mentioned earlier, um, um, I did not have any other items at this point. Um, do you want to maybe talk about the minutes? Just that we'll have them next time. 
Um, sure. Um, th I did not have time to finish them all the way um, from last meeting, so they will be on uh, the next meeting's agenda. Thank you. And <clears throat> I think uh, one of the things that we uh, didn't all, none of us realized was we weren't recording at the front, so it's just made it a lot harder to pull together. Yeah. So I apologize um, for that. I forgot that. That's why I wanted to make sure I <laughs> hit the record button. Thank you. Uh, I think brief announcements from the chair. Uh, just that I, I was uh, able to meet with um, Councilman Chapman uh, during the break, and I'll give you an update during our session on um, <clears throat> the strategic planning. I think as we're froze. Yep, I think so. Seems he did. Yep. All right. His Hopefully internet we'll... might have just disconnected shortly. I guess I could text him. Hi, sorry about that. Um, technical difficulties. I just think that I met with uh, Commissioner um, Chapman and Commissioner Carson. Sorry, is, anything, is um, everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I will give everybody an update on the outcome of that uh, at our regular scheduled um, meeting. Uh, the other thing, I think that's about it for me. So um, uh, any other announcements from commissioners? Hearing none, um, any announcements from <clears throat> City Council liaisons? I do have one thing to mention uh, to the group. Um, uh, so uh, we, we, on a regular basis, uh, as members of the League of California Cities, get updates on, on for example, on ballot measures. And there's one very, very significant ballot measure for municipal finance that uh, they're advising us is highly likely to qualify for the November 2024 ballot called the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. Um, it contains a great many provisions that uh, could impact uh, and create stricter rules for taxes, fees, assessments, and property related fees that support local services. Um, the league is warning that could create huge fiscal uncertainty about our ability to sustain local services. Um, the in checking on the Secretary of State's website, um, the preliminary um, estimates for qualification, the sampling they do, and the actual counts in certain counties suggest that this measure already has a hundred thousand more signatures than it would need to qualify. Uh, the deadline for it to for that determination to be made was supposed to be at the beginning of November, but there was legal action to allow more time because it came right in the middle of the general election. So they'll be giving that. I imagine by December we'll know for certain whether it's qualified or not. Um, if it does qualify, as seems likely, I think it could be of value to understand how this measure in particular could affect the city of Davis. So as you think of your agenda, your strategic planning, this is one where you would have a great deal of time um, to, to think about it. But I, I can already tell you there are certain very significant issues uh, that I'm aware of that could affect the city of Davis finances. Um, and I, I think it would be worth getting a handle on this long before the public votes on it. So that's all I had. Ezra, could I just ask a question about that? Ezra, you're muted. Yes, please, Commissioner Neville. Thank you, Commissioner Kirkin. Thank you so much, Council Member Carson, for filling us in again. I know you talked about that earlier. Who's the sponsor of that? 
It's it's California Business Roundtable, which is an organization made up of a number of the major corporations across California. Um, and my understanding from what the league was reporting to us a few months ago also is that there's a very significant component of real estate industry money uh, that's gone into helping to qualify this for the ballot. Thank you. And the full text and summary, that'll be available as soon as it's certified as qualified. Is that right? It's actually already available through the, the Attorney General's website. Uh, every word is there for everyone to read right now. And so for a, one of the interesting provisions says that if between now and and November 2024, we enacted, for example, a property transfer tax, like we've talked about as a mechanism for um, housing, uh, funding our housing trust fund, that um, this measure contains language that would uh, terminate that and require municipalities to go back with a second election to try to validate something that uh, uh, even if it passed between now and 2024, it, it under the terms of the measure, um, at least presumably, um, would be revoked. Um, there's a number of really interesting provisions in here, um, too many to go into tonight. Um, and understanding and thinking about the local impacts like that, um, there are other provisions in it, I think, that just straight flat out prohibit a property transfer tax, but I may not be reading it correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Carson. <clears throat> uh, any other any any other comments? Yeah, uh, Chair Beam, if I can jump in real quick. Good evening, everyone. I'm not sure. I, I apologize for being a few minutes late to the start. I'm not sure if it was covered or not. Um, the governor did rescind, uh, as of February 28, 2023, the state of emergency in California. Uh, so what that means is uh, moving forward, we're anticipating starting in March uh, that we'll be back in in-person meetings. Not that it won't happen prior to then, but logistically, it seems like March would be that your February meeting would most likely be the last one that's able to be conducted via Zoom. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that that's coming down the pipeline, um, and it has been uh, has put that forward so the 28th of February is when it officially ends. So I know this is that has been discussed in this commission and many others, and it's a definitely of interest to folks. So I want to pass that along to you this evening. And that's all I have for you. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, now we move on to item four, which is general public comment. Um, do we have anyone wishing to make a comment on a matter not on the agenda? So for those on Zoom, please uh, do a raise hand or on the phone, press star nine. If you would like to make a public comment on items that are not on the agenda, and I see none. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, we are moving on to the consent calendar since there are no, uh, actually, well, why don't I, do I have to do another public comment for the consent calendar? I think I do. No, no, no. Not at this point, we have no consent calendar, so. Okay, so. We'll move on to the. Next one. All right, so, sorry. We'll oh. move on into the next regular agenda. Um, we've got two regularly scheduled regular items on the agenda. The first one is on the budgeting and fiscal impacts of vacancies and recruitment. And I wanted to thank um, Elena and um, Kelly, I think, uh, for taking this on. Um, we, uh, I think, because of the timing of the uh, HR manager who's um, in the process of leaving or has already left, um, it, it was decided that uh, that was probably not going to be the best way of doing this. So I really appreciate um, Elena and Kelly um, putting in the extra effort, I guess, to bring this information to us. Thank you. Over to you. Okay, um, so commissioners and uh, council liaisons, I will actually start uh, this item. Um, one of the things we would like to discuss um, and part of this obviously commission is a budgeting and the fiscal impact. So I wanted to start on the budgeting side and how we 
generally budget for salaries and benefits for the city. So it's kind of uh, well understood, I guess. Um, we there were some questions uh, whether vacancies are included or not included. Um, you know how the entire budgeting process is completed for the city, and so um, kind of wanted to eliminate that confusion. We do budget for all positions that are authorized by council. So when we bring um, uh, a budget during a budget process, when we be, bring the budget for adoption, one of the documents that's included uh, for council's approval is authorized positions listing. So all of those positions by department are then approved and authorized by council, and all of those positions are budgeted. Now, those positions might be filled at that point in time or may be vacant. So we do not discriminate against vacant positions because the idea is that the city, um, each department specifically, is able to hire in those positions, and we want to make sure those dollars are actually in place uh, once the uh, a person is hired in. Um, we budget for all uh, related salaries and benefits. Um, the salaries are based on a salary table that council approves as well, and those usually are brought by the HR department for approval. Um, a lot of the times they are also um, in line and particularly like uh, cost of living adjustment increases or any bargaining uh, contracts increases um, that are already in the agreements. So those salary schedules are, you know, go in line with those. So the salary schedule, the salaries are based on um, those schedules, um, as well as benefits. Most of the benefits, um, the way they're being paid or um, given to um, employees are specified and described um, in the bargaining agreement. So we provide the budgeting for those based on um, uh, as it's specified in those agreements. One thing that we do for the general fund and general fund alone, um, we do include um, a provision or a dollar amount that we estimate would be for vacancies, mainly because general fund is your general dollars and those are the dollars that mostly in demand, um, they could be spent on variety of projects. And so we would like to make sure we don't lose um, the ability to do something knowing that there will be vacancy savings. So in fiscal year 22-23, when the budget was approved, the vacancy savings assumption was um, one and a half million dollars for the general fund alone. Um, we don't necessarily always know if we're going to achieve those savings uh, because we don't know which positions will be vacant, how many of them will be vacant or for how long but that's an assumption that's been used. Now, in the past years, that assumption has been significantly lower, so that's been actually increased, but we have noticed, and you will hear from um, our HR um, staff, that um, that dollar amount has been actually greater um, than we have budgeted. Um, that's part of a reason why we didn't increase on the budget side. So I just wanted to make sure um, that is kind of understood because I know there were questions about, well, do you budget for positions uh, for all positions or not? So I just want to make sure um, that it's clear that we do budget for all positions. Um, unless specifically um, council in their approval process determine that they want to eliminate certain positions. And if um, anyone does want to see it, again, authorized position listing will include, we try to include um, a change component from prior year to the current year or the most current list of positions to the next, you know, like let's say next year. Um, what were the changes? So if there's any additions or reductions in positions, you will see it on that particular list. And all of those positions that are listed then are budgeted. There could be any changes during the year that could be approved or, you know, presented to council for approval. Um, they could be approved, denied, whatever it is, but um, council has the authority um, to make sure that uh, that position listing is amended. So I hope that clarifies that. And with that, I would like to hand over the discussion on the vacancies and recruitment side to um, Chris Bench. Um, who is our um, currently HR analyst, but um, has been promoted um, effective December, I believe, to the HR director. 
So please welcome Chris. Thank you, Elena. And it's nice to meet everyone here on the Finance and Budget Commission. Um, so I was asked to come present a little bit of information related to recruitments, some of the challenges we're experiencing, along with uh, our vacancy rate. Um, one, one thing I did was look back into our numbers for the last five years uh, and kind of compared to the current year. And for the previous five years, so 2017 to 2021, we were averaging about 35 employment separations per year, 13 retirements and 22 non-retirement separations. But for 22, uh, 2022 alone, we're on pace for a total of 57 separations, um, 24 retirements by the end of the year, and 33 non-retirement separations. So we're about 64% higher just in 2022 in turnover. Now, Davis not unique. Everyone is experiencing this type of struggle in retention around us uh, in the area. And you know, the labor market is at historically tight levels. The turnover that we're experiencing correlates to the number of recruitments that we have to open each year. And over the last five years, we've averaged about 39 recruitments for regular uh, full-time and part-time positions. So excluding temporary part-time. And this year alone, we've already opened 55 recruitments. So we're about 40% higher on average for this year. And we've hit some roadblocks in some of our recruitments. It's more difficult um, even attracting qualified candidates. Uh, and we've had to re-recruit several times in certain classifications. Sometimes we're getting down to the job offer and we're getting uh, applicants turning us down um, at, because they have many other offers out there to consider. So we're exploring ways that we can improve our recruitment efforts um, so that we can put Davis kind of at the forefront of our applicants' minds and consideration. Now, there's some positions that have been more difficult than others uh, to fill. That includes our engineering positions, planners, inspectors, uh, urban forestry, wastewater treatment operators, and actually recently management and financial analysts. Now, the, there's also a cost to turnover. It can be difficult to quantify, but it's not insignificant. Uh, with you know, high rates of turnover, you have increased advertising expenditures, uh, increased burden on HR staff time, and uh, increased department training costs as you uh, continue to have new staff to train. Overall, the city vacancy rate right now, as of today, is around, around 11%. Uh, and these are all positions, uh, all funding sources. We have a few departments that are more heavily uh, affected by vacancies. Um, we have a brand new department, social services and housing. So obviously that's still taking some time to uh, fill out that department. Uh, but other departments that are disproportionately affected in terms of high vacancy include our public works, engineering, and transportation, so, you know, our engineers, um, along with uh, finance um, and community development and sustainability. And that's kind of the heart of what I was, you know, wanting to present today. Uh, but if there, you know, any questions uh, that anyone wants to ask related to um, the recruitment, vacancies I'm happy happy to answer them thank you uh and great that you were able to make it I was uh, I was operating on old information um we've got some hands up I think uh, Commissioner Jacobs is is first uh, followed by Commissioner Neville and then Commissioner Gus please. um first what one uh, questions have been have arisen and critics of the city often complain about city salaries and total compensation and so on. I'm assuming that every time we negotiate, and I've been told this actually by your predecessor, Chris, that um, every time we negotiate a new uh, contract with different uh, bargaining units, we do studies of com comparable positions of, to use as benchmarks for our own negotiating positions. I'm also told that those 
can become public or are public once the negotiations are completed. Is, is that, am I correct in that? Can, in other words, could we, we as a commission or as a subcommittee ask for uh, comparative studies that are done by professional consultants uh, position for the different bargaining units? Uh, and could we actually see that? That's my first question. Um, so the if there is a completely finalized study uh, that can be discoverable as a public record, mm -hmm. um, the to answer your question on um, doing studies, uh, the city is actually in the middle of a citywide compensation study. Uh, it will often get written into bargaining contracts themselves, like and in our current MOUs, there was a stipulation to complete a study. Uh, by the end of this year. Uh, we're actually looking towards more completing it in February, March range. Uh, that will lead into and inform uh, the city as we go into negotiations with every single unit right now uh, have contracts expiring at the end of June 2023. And I could, if I could add to that, the, the, um, the studies are a total compensation studies, so it's salary and select benefits. Um, trying to provide a, as much as we can an apples to apples comparison to other communities mm -hmm. in the past round of negotiations um you know uh the council set uh sort of their their target if you will as being um about five percent below the um the median for most groups and, and to what extent is salary the issue uh in in our struggle to to fill these vacant positions is there any way of quantifying that or do you have any sense of that chris it does vary by classification um you know as overall benefit package and total compensation salaries you know just one component um it can be particularly tough uh in certain positions where people are comparing to uh private sector and not really considering the overall total package, uh, including the pension and their generous health and welfare benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of falls on you know, HR's job to see if we can promote that those overall additional benefits that are a significant portion of that total comp package. And, and one last question. Sure. When, when you compute the cost of, of those benefits, do you include that one time, that yearly add-on from CalPERS, which was like seven to eight million dollars, if I remember right, at least at times, uh, to, as as CalPERS tries to fully fund, uh, uh, get up to near hundred percent of its pension our our pension liabilities. In other words, is there some way that you prorate that as part of the benefit? Uh, Elena uh, might be best to speak to the accounting side of things uh, on that proration. Um, so um, Commissioner Jacobs, from um, accounting standpoint, we budget for it because we do have to um, make that payment and we do um, try to allocate those costs um, across the departments um, and share them equitably, I guess based on, and what we usually do is base it on the positions um, or a number of positions um, in each department. Um, however, I mean, this is kind of going into more of a human resources world, but um, whether we hire that position or not, that bill is still due to CalPERS, sure. uh, whether we have those people or not. So. Um, a reality is when we do a compensation study, that's a bill that was due for all the prior service of the employees that's been with the city. Um, whether it's being looked at as part of the study, um, I, I mean, of course, yeah. I'm going to ask Chris to confirm that, but I would assume that it probably wouldn't be. However, right. from accounting and budgeting perspective, we do mm -hmm. include it as part of the labor um, uh, wages and benefits. That's Thank you. Thank you very much.
Hey, I just noticed that uh, Councilman Carson's got his hand up. Is, is it a comment right now, Dan? So I thought maybe you- Yeah, the only point I was going to make, uh, Ezra, was that and not only do we uh, do those those studies compared compared uh, comparing total compensation to other organizations in the region, when we have brought collective bargaining agreements to council for approval, you will see information uh, uh, details about the outcome of that uh, of that study we and you know for that particular group uh so we had it for firefighters we had it for cops um is there anything i've i've gotten wrong there kelly no i think you covered them all thank you <clears throat> okay commissioner neville please Donna, you're muted. My apologies. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I, I feel your pain. I'm hearing all of the same stories from my colleagues who are in state service as well, and particularly in terms of recruiting and those kinds of job classifications. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Um, the first one, I, I'm I'm not actually sure about this. Does, does the city, do the city employees, um, does their CalPERS um, contract actually include the CalPERS healthcare coverage as well? Um, so the, we do contract with CalPERS for health insurance um, and the specific contribution um, to uh, the cafeteria package for employees are specified in each bargaining unit. Um, most of the bargaining units are similar on the formula, um, it, uh, except for fire is a little bit different. Um, it's around on an annualized basis that if you know for an employee with family coverage, it's around uh, twenty seven thousand dollars a year that the city contributes per employee towards health and dental. Thank you. And it's inter it was interesting to me that the school district is contemplating terminating the healthcare portion of its contract with CalPERS because it believes that if it does so, it will not only save the school district money, but that the employee contributions will be less. I don't know if that's correct or not. I haven't seen the analysis, but I just am curious if the city has, has ever considered whether that would make, whether terminating the healthcare coverage of CalPERS and pursuing coverage elsewhere would make any sense. You know, I can't speak to whether it, uh, it's been considered, you know, before my time um, or uh, if there's many agencies looking at that, but CalPERS is a, a robust uh, healthcare uh, offering. Um, they offer several HMO plans and PPO plans, but they do have pretty high premiums. Um, and so, city contributions are based on uh, the Kaiser premiums. And so the increase each year based on Kaiser affects how much uh, the city is gonna contribute for the next uh, next year. So that's definitely something the city could always have open to, to look at. Um, it would be, since it's built into the MOUs uh, that our contributions are based on the CalPERS rates, that also be subject to bargaining. And uh, Donna, I wanted to add to kind of confirm what Chris said. It's one of the things usually has to be looked at, but it is subject to a bargaining, um, and, you know, with each bargaining unit. Sure, sure. And, and my other question is a really just kind of a, the big picture, probably impossible to answer question, but this is obviously, this is a California-wide issue. It's a nationwide issue. But what, what are some of the, the organizations that look deeply at these issues, what are they suggesting in terms of what city governments can do to attract and retain really qualified employees? What are their suggestions for changes that cities can make in either their compensation or benefits or just their cultures? Wow, yeah. what's the secret sauce? What's the... Yeah. Uh, if, if there was a solution out there, um, you know, I'll sign up for it. But the, you know, there's can be generational differences on what, you know, employees are looking for out of employment. 
Uh, one thing we've heard that the, the newest generation of the workforce values their work-life balance more, values leave time. And yet the city actually has a very generous starting uh, leave program at three weeks of vacation per year for most classifications. Um, many public agencies start out at two weeks. Um, so we have some very good benefits that I think uh, we're making moves. We're making moves to highlight them better uh, to advertise because uh, have heard that that the kind of the newer generation of the workforce values that leave time a bit more. Um, but we're keeping our fingers on the pulse to see what uh, agencies are trying to do to have success. We've heard about agencies in the Bay Area offering pretty excessive um, signing bonuses in certain departments. But even that isn't been, hasn't been the most successful. Uh, so agencies continue to try new things to see you know what could work. But when we're all competing for a smaller pool, um, that's part of the challenge. Um, and typically, you see it ebb and flow with the economy. You know, when uh, we have a robust economy, low unemployment, that makes it harder to recruit. When you know, if we go into recessionary environments higher unemployment that actually might alleviate some of the recruiting struggles. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'll just add one thing that my um, former state agency did when it was having a really difficult time, particularly with financial management and accountants, um, it, it instituted something called a longevity bonus. And I'm not a huge advocate of longevity bonuses, for a number of reasons, but they they found that it actually was really an effective tool for keeping people when they were at kind of this critical juncture where they might have been ready to jump ship and it kept them on board long enough to stay in and move into a higher pay level. And it was a bonus that wasn't purposeable, so it didn't have that accompanying liability with it. Um, so I'll just throw that out there. Not recommending it necessarily, but it did turn out to be surprisingly effective at the time. Thank you. Hello. I, I was going to add, Donna, um, I, as Chris mentioned, and you've said it yourself, there are a number of agencies experiencing exactly the same thing. Um, and um, accountants, obviously, we're on accounting side, so we look into it as well, um, anything financial related. And one of the just kind of a factual, interesting factual thing that came about is that in early 2000s, there were... Um, a lot more um, people that were getting, let's say, accounting degrees. Um, and now um, it's half of the students that are actually getting it. So we have a um, lot smaller population um, of workers that uh, we are looking for, I guess, or that are qualified. So that's one of the things. And then um, separately, the GFOA, which is Government Finance Officers Association, published a paper where they did a research in general um, about hiring processes within the government. Uh, one of the things was, um, um, I think was one of the first ones items was um, how long it takes for government to hire a worker. Um, and I think they stated it at least three to six months usually. And when you're in private, it takes a lot quicker. So that was one of the suggestions, but they had certainly other um, things that they talked about that, um, that they found um, that um, takes a lot longer, which I think Chris mentioned, uh, you know, um, the newer generations, what they're looking for. And now that we've gone through a pandemic, there are a number of people when the hiring is done also looking for uh, what is the uh, ability to do remote work as well. So it's kind of changes with time. So there's, there's no one or two items that we can say, this is it. I think there's a variety and it really depends probably on um, the type of a position it is. Thank you, Elena. Um, uh, Commissioner Gus, you've had your hand up, please. Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a couple questions, but I, I want to start with a follow up and then ask the question. So the, you mentioned the twenty-seven thousand dollar figure for benefits. I assume that's based on a family of four. Is that correct? It's um, two or more dependents is the highest level. That's family coverage, um, okay. and at family coverage rate, um, it's the formula is based on the Kaiser rates, um, and so. Um, then it depends what people sign up on. Um, 
if you know we all if you have individuals or employee only obviously this that's they're costing the city less uh, but they're, if they're at the family rate then yes it'd be that twenty seven thousand a year and so if i'm an employee and, and for full disclosure i'm i'm a state employee so that's um it's it's different but but we do we do deal with similar formulas so if i'm an employee and don't have any dependents and I'm doing equal work to another employee who has three dependents. Uh, you know, potentially, hearing what you're saying, uh, my my compensation is, at least on the health insurance side, half of what my colleagues is simply because I don't have a dependent. Is that correct? So the city uh, does offer, and it, and many public agencies offer uh, what's called. Uh, cash in lieu. Um, so there is a, uh, an amount uh, of cash that an employee can receive if they waive benefits. Um, the maximum at the city currently is $500 a month. So that's $6,000 per year if people are waiving benefits. Um, so there could be um, a discrepancy, exactly what you're pointing out, that you know when you look at all the city expenditures, uh, the city is in effect spending more uh, for someone that's enrolled in the family. Um, that's not uncommon uh, and typically where, you know, the government benefits are structured. Yeah. And, and so at the state, how this works is um, if you do not have a, a, a family dependent, you don't get cash in lieu of benefits. It's, you just aren't paid for that entirely. So that, that sounds like that is an advantage to local governments over the state. I, I appreciate that. So essentially, if it, I, I have a contribution to do up to two people, let's just say, and if I don't, if I take coverage for myself and don't take coverage for dependent, then I get $500 a month from the city. Is that, is, do I understand that correctly? Not not quite in terms of the city's uh, cash and lieu program, um, but the um, you have to waive uh, all medical and dental to get the five hundred, uh, and and so um, it's actually uh, it's even a bit more nuanced uh, in the MOUs. Over the years, the amount of cash and lieu available for employees to keep in, in lieu of enrolling the benefits has decreased. Um, so it used to be a much higher level at the city, closer to the full value of, you know, like this $27,000 in cash. Um, and then over the years through negotiations, you know, this is many, many, year ago, many years ago prior to me arriving, the city changed that amount, uh, but also kind of grandfathered in people based on their hire date. So there are current employees that, you know, based on their hire date, can be enrolled in the health insurance and receive some cash back. But all new employees after a certain date, they're limited uh, to cash back if they only if they wait everything. Okay. Um, and I would just say th this is something that I see with my colleagues at, at work. Um, you know, hear, hearing what we're saying, there's there's a recruiting challenge among the, the younger workforce. And you know, I'd say pretty much. Most people under 50, for sure, under 40 and definitely under 30, the younger generation is less likely to, to have children and, and less likely, the, the marriage rates are lower. Um, and then older workers are no longer going to have dependents. So if the benefits are the big selling point, but you don't qualify for them, then that compensation isn't available. Um, and so that, inherently makes compensation less competitive to individuals who are younger who have yet to start a family or individuals who are older who have their family has grown and they no longer have dependents they may have been divorced whatever um and and i would also just point out that you know it's not intended for sure for certain not saying it's intended at, at the city but um there's definitely different rates among uh, LGBTQ communities of, you know, marriage and qualifying for, for benefits. 
where, you know, I'll just say personally, um, I think those kind of benefit policies should be maybe not entirely uh, equal, but they should be a little bit more equitable because I think they've gone too far on the other side where it benefits somebody with four or five dependents and then same person doing same or better work in the same position is being compensated substantially less just because they have a different lifestyle. Uh, and I don't, I don't think that's really um, very progressive at all. And, and so, you know, I, I would encourage maybe reevaluating those policies to ensure that the contributions still exist and people can still be covered. I don't think anybody should lose their insurance but to also make sure that there is some mitigation um, for uh, employees who are single. Um, and the, the next question, which sort of goes along with this. Um, so, you know, I'm a, again, full disclosure, I'm, I'm a state employee covered by local 1000. And, you know, the way our health insurance works is we pay into it, uh, the state gives us, you know, 700 bucks a month to purchase something on the little internal state exchange that they have. And then we're responsible for, for the difference. We also pay for what's called other post-employment benefits or retiree health care. Uh, we pay for the PERS contribution um, and we, we may pay union dues um, and, and all sorts of other voluntary contributions. In, in general, from, from talking to local 1000 about this, the states, uh, take home pay from the salary. You know, if you look at a state employee salary, well, we're, we're really well paid. Um, but we net between 58 and 65%, depending on benefit elections. Do you have a general idea of what um, city staff net? Because ultimately, when employees are looking at making rent, you know, buying Thanksgiving dinner, um, all, all those things that, that employees should be able to afford, um, how much we take home and not what's on the top line is important. Do you have an idea? If you don't tonight, if you could get that to us, I'd appreciate it. You know, um, looking at um, the average net take home pay uh, may be a, a bit difficult, but um, you do bring up some good points in terms of the you know, our employees have to pay their member per share. Um, and we actually have cost share agreements in place uh, with the bargaining units where uh, members are paying not only the CalPERS stated member share, but part of the employer share. Um, and then there is uh, for employees that are on family coverage, um, they do have to pay in towards that coverage on for most plans, not all of them. Uh, there are some CalPERS plans that are fully covered under the, the city's benefit package. So I'm not sure if, how, if we would be able to really get that net impact um, because also everyone's tax filings are individual and different in terms of how they handle it. And we don't have, con you know, we don't have control over you know, how they file their, you know, their W-4 withholding. So I don't know if we'd be able to get that for you. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I, I'm just pointing it out that, you know, especially as it relates to other post-employment benefits, um, I don't know what the city's agreements are, um, but the state's agreements with um, uh, retiree healthcare under PEPRA, it's now 25 years for a full vest and you have to retire with the employer. So um, if, let, let's just say I left the state as part of part of the, uh, great resignation. I'm being charged 3.5% of my salary a month for a benefit that doesn't stay with me because unless I retire with the state, I don't have access to it. I have to work 15 years to get 50% of it and then retire from the state. I have to work 25 years and then retire from the state to get the full benefit. So, um, you know, Essentially, I would I would argue that's a tax on public service, and the uh, you know when you add up the glad you mentioned the retirement health care plan that's significantly more. Is the city fully uh, meshed into Social Security the way the state is, or is it uh, independent of Social Security? So when I uh, you got a couple of different questions in there. Um, first, just want to remind that any any contemplated change to benefits. 
obviously has to go through the negotiation process uh, with the groups and um, the benefits are in the MOUs themselves. Um, the, the, you were talking about OPEP for a second. Um, the, most of our groups, um, so we have retiree health for all of the bargaining groups. Most of them, there's not a employee required contribution towards it. Um, there is still a defined benefit for retiree health, even for brand new employees. Um, the, over the years with negotiations, the benefit for employees has been negotiated to different levels, um, but there's still a base level that even a new employee, if they make it to retirement through the city, would be eligible for. But they're, um, for most of the groups, they're not paying into that. So there wouldn't be that kind of tax that you mentioned that you have at the state. Um, as far as Social Security goes, the city does not participate in Social Security. Um, so we're able to be exempt from Social Security because of CalPERS. Um, and so our regular and full-time employees are enrolled, our regular full-time and part-time employees are enrolled in CalPERS. Uh, and actually our temporary part-time employees are enrolled in what's considered a FICA replacement program. Um, it's, a, it's called PARS. Uh, and it's in lieu of Social Security. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I recognize I've gone on too long. And I'll just say thank, thank you for the answers. And um, I, I'm glad to hear that the city has done some of that because there, there are, to Donna's point, there are some real substantial recruitment and retention challenges with the state of California that are related to, to that. Um, but I also think, you know, um, as, as we enter a, a, now I see the state budget as we enter a, a not great budget environment, it's going to be difficult because, you know, increasing contributions is, is the easiest thing to do from employees. But ultimately, even if you can weather the recession, right, with, with reduced benefits, increased contribution, reduced salaries, those sorts of things, which, you know, or I think are definitely coming down at the state level. I won't speak for the city level. Um, then at the, at the end of the recession, the recruitment challenges that we have now, I think are, are gonna be on steroids. So it's you know finding that balance to, to minimize that and encourage people to stay and, and, and all that. And I understand that. And I just wanna say that I think this has been implied through, through this conversation with you and everyone who participates in this, but it doesn't get said often enough. Um, you know, government bureaucrats, again, I, I am one. Um, we uh, had to put up with a lot of things. Um, you know, we're, the take home pay is not the greatest. Uh, and oftentimes employees don't feel appreciated uh, by the public because it's usually only the negative experiences that really get through. And I think, you know, I'm thankful for all of the city's employees and all the city staff. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say that, even though I think it's been implied in this conversation. And thank you so much for the answers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Gus. Uh, Commissioner Sandino, you're next. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you, Elena, thank Chris. I have a few questions, try to take it in a little different direction. I tried to take some notes but uh, may not have done it perfectly. But I, I thought I heard that we have 55, city has 55 ongoing recruitments and plus or minus on average 11% vacancy rate. Is that, is that right, more or less? Yeah, we've opened up five, 55 recruitments just in 2022 alone year to date. Okay, the, the, what, what is the current number of positions that are not filled now, estimated? Uh, about 41. 41, okay. Um, so I, I heard, uh, I heard, uh, uh, Elena, I think I heard that part of the budget process, there's an estimated cost savings to the general fund as a, as a result of not having the positions completely filled. I think I heard that right. 1.5 million estimate. Um, yeah. okay. Is there any thinking or estimate about what the cost of these vacancies are to the city, not in, not in cost savings, but cumulative impact in terms of work not getting done, work getting assigned, getting deferred and delayed and becomes more costly later, um, potentially hiring consultants to fill the gaps and maybe doing that at a higher cost than would have been 
to a city employee. Is there any analysis or can you speak to that? Because that, that seems to me sort of the big issue out here. What, what is this really costing the city overall? Um, well, um, I guess I will start and Chris, I will probably defer the, the rest of it to you, but um, we, the finance have not done an analysis to go through that. Um, I think it would be quite uh, difficult for us to do because we don't necessarily always know where the vacancies are. Uh, we would have to look at it, what's existing. Um, <laughs> ironically, <laughs> I don't have enough staff and finance to do that. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, reviewing that, that's going to be very difficult to figure out what the productivity rate would be. We can certainly probably evaluate hiring um, uh, staff uh, such as contractors to do that, but we do have to be very careful. I'm gonna let Chris speak on that one. We have to be very careful about how we do that because we do have um, employees in place that or positions in place that's supposed to do that work. Um, so that's, you know, has to be uh, waters carefully, <laughs> you know, navigated. Um, but there hasn't been an analysis per se done uh, to evaluate what it actually costing. Do, does it cost the city? Of course. Um, you know, it, especially the work that is not done because we don't have enough people to do it. Um, but uh, there's no value to it at this point. Chris, back to you. Yeah, I'll add on, uh, Elena um, was pretty uh, good in that explanation. Um, obviously, if there's sat budgeted salary savings from vacancies, uh, and if the city's using contract help to kind of get some of that work done, that's gonna eat away at some of that savings. Uh, now, uh, the, the benefit package is a significant cost for total comp, and so, with a contractor, yeah, they may have a pretty high hourly rate, but you're not paying CalPERS, you're not paying the health insurance costs. Um, so it may get close to that total. Um, and then certain certain areas, the city has been able to contract uh, out to get some of the work done. Um, inspectors is one area that we are able to use contract help, but we do have to be very careful as a city to make sure we're complying with the rules related to contracting um versus hiring uh actual employees um another question i heard you ask which i think is even less quantifiable is the you know long-term impact of kind of delayed work or you know is something maybe going to be more expensive to work on it later if it's if we can't do it you know now because we don't have the staff um so i think that's there probably is a cost there but maybe less quantifiable I, I appreciate those comments and I, I'm throwing this out to my commissioners and, and the council and staff, as I think this is um, something that deserves some analysis. And, and I, I appreciate perhaps Elena, it, it couldn't be a, a quantitative analysis or that would be very expensive to, to get some real certainty numbers, what this is costing the city. But I'm just, I, I think there, there needs to be some nothing else, a, quali a qualitative analysis, some thought on this, because uh, you can make the case that, uh, well, if we save 1.5 million, that saves the city with the current vacancies. If all the positions were vacant, just think how much that would save the city. Okay, of course, that's an absurd example, but I, I think there's a cost to the city. I, I feel it in terms of things that uh, aren't getting done. I know we could, everybody would have their own experiences they could identify. And I think this has to be part of the, the, the conversation that uh, um, how important it is to keep these positions filled. And I'd make an argument for more positions because of, of the lack of um, getting the work that's needed to be done. But, you know, I'm just an observer. It'd be, I think, important for the city folks to identify these more clearly. I know we've done some good work on identifying um, uh, shortages in, in road maintenance, et cetera, but maybe other parts of the city should, should do that as well. So I'm interested in that. I would also throw out the idea then, um, I think there should be a, a look at consultants and uh, to the extent we're using uh, consultants for inspectors, I think that'd be a good comparison. You know, what what is that really mean to the city? And are there other areas that we're using consultants that uh, are providing benefits to the city and whether that's the right hiring mix 
or whether we should um, um, take take a look at trying to have city staff. So those are the fi financial issues. The other the other kind of questions I saw were relating to HR recruitment, and uh, it's probably beyond the scope of this commission, but I think it's an important subject. I would just throw out here because you could translate make this in fiscal. What I'm seeing as um, the number one issue now for hiring is remote working possibilities. And you mentioned that, Elena. So I don't know if the city has started to develop remote working possibilities, but as the pandemic eases, I think that's gonna be the number one challenge for recruitment for public uh, service employees. What does a particular city have for, um, for uh, um, uh, remote working possibilities? So I'd ask you that, is that something you've given some thought? And that's my last question, or is there any ideas of developing remote working possibilities and how does that uh, currently stand with the city? Ellie, do you want to handle this one first? So, okay, I'll, ju I'll jump in then. Um, so we do have a remote working policy right now that's in place. Um, we put it in place during the pandemic and it remains in place that it allows not all positions, but it allows eligible positions the option of up to 50% remote work op uh, opportunity. You're absolutely right, Commissioner Sandino, that as we've had recruitments or interviews, um, I think probably in almost all of them, we are asked by somebody, what's the possibility for remote work? Um, we have not moved to a place where we have a comfort level with 100% remote work. Um, but we do have the 50%. We also don't have all of our positions that are eligible for remote work. It's, it's really hard for a firefighter or a parks maintenance worker to call it in. Just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but we are seeing that as a, a challenge in our recruitment overall. And it is an expectation much as, as Chris mentioned that, um, you know, certain demographics and, and certain folks are very much interested in that um, type of a, an option and, and are seeing it really as a, um, a benefit that the city could provide. Well, that, that's good to hear. You have given it some thought. I don't think I, I, we have to solve it here, but uh, I appreciate you working on that. And that to be would be another one of these comparison possibilities now, not just salaries and benefits, but remote work possibilities that. Uh, could give us an advantage if we're kind of progressing uh, in, in that direction with the city. And I, I'm not a big fan myself of working at remotely, but uh, I know that's popular with others. So I'll turn it over to somebody else. Thanks for trying to address my questions. Thanks, David. Um, I had my hand up, but I don't know. Uh, Commissioner Gus, do you have a quick comment? Uh, we've just been- we've Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, does the city have uh, distance policy for remote work um, to require remote workers to be within 50 miles, 100 miles, whatever, and if so, what is, what is it? I don't believe we have a distance policy um, in our remote work policy. Kelly, do you remember off the top of your head? I do not remember off the top of my head. I know we did have some discussion early on about if people were going to be out of state, that that has different tax implications, et cetera, um, or can. Um, but I don't recall that we have, I have to look at it. Yeah. Oh. I, I don't recall having um, the mileage kind of like, or distance included in our policy. But that would be something we would consider because right now we're operating on an interim policy that was uh, put forth during the pandemic. Um, and so that's what we have in place now. And if we, if the city is considering a you know, permanent policy, then that would be something we would need to consider. Yeah, and without going into too much detail, I'll just say that um, I think especially local government, but all government needs to be connected to its constituents in, 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 in some way. Um, and I think remote work in general is great, um, but um, I, I think that there should be some thought um, given to make sure that uh, people who are working for the city um, and, and making decisions that impact city residents, um, you know, have some familiarity um, with the locality. So I would encourage that to be looked into in the future. And thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think a lot of my questions have been covered by, by others. Um, one 
question I guess I uh, have that has, I don't think has been answered um, is whether we're doing exit interviews <clears throat> just to flag sort of what is causing, pe what, what people say is causing them to leave. And also when we get rejections that we're collecting information, just so we've got, you know, good evidence base uh, in terms of the strategies. Right. Um, so we, we do attempt to complete an exit interview with any regular full-time or regular part-time employee that leaves us. Uh, and so that historically has been conducted by myself or Janet. Um, the, we haven't always been able to get data or collect data on when people turn us down um, for why they're turning us down. Um, and, uh, but when we do, we're trying to record that so we can look back and see you know, you know, if it was, uh, you know, an opportunity that had more remote work or better salary, because you're right, that those are important pieces of the puzzle. Uh, if we can, if we can collect that data, um, one thing that I do uh, want to start doing um, is not only doing exit interviews, but um, doing what they're called stay interviews, and checking in with our staff while they're still here. Uh, and to see, you know, how the city could be, you know, doing better for them and, you know, where do they see room for improvement or what they're looking for in their career um, so that we're not just talking to them as they're out the door to find out why they're leaving. So that's uh, something that I plan to start doing. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. Um, I was just part of a major project for Department of Water and Power, uh, you know, 6,000 employees, and it was a combination of all these things. Um, do you have anything that you can share with us as to what is the most frequent reason that people are leaving or top three reasons? You know, I, I, I don't have that data uh, available, um, but, you know, anecdotally, you know, we're losing people. You know, if we're in a tough spot a little bit geographically, you know, if people have opportunities on the other side of the causeway and they live on the other side of the causeway, and it either offers a more competitive salary or more, you know, anything slightly better. That's a, that's tough uh, considering how much traffic has increased in the last ten years. Um, so we we do see people that are taking other jobs that happen to live in the Sacramento area, and they're taking jobs at other agencies over there. Um, so it's kind of runs the gamut. Um, one thing I'm not seeing is people leaving just because they're you know dissatisfied with you know current management. It's just there's a lot of opportunities out there, um, and so it can be someone's best opportunity if you know if they hit a wall in our organizational structure, they might have an opportunity at a, another agency. We've also had a higher than previous um, number of retirements. Yeah, which is a little bit of a different yeah. issue, but um, it still results in the same sort of vacancies and need for recruitment. And you know, I expect. Um, there to be some more just with the demographics of the, the city, the city employees. Thank you. And I've got one final question. I'm fascinated at this, um, this median, 5% uh, below median, and maybe the council reps can speak to it, and maybe they can, I don't know. Um, but I was just thinking about that median, if it's state median and where we fit into the pie, sorry, where we fit like size-wise and the cost of living. Um, and the other question I had was that 5% on average or every single position is pegged at 5% at below the median? So maybe start with the second question first. So uh, Kelly, jump in um, if you uh, feel the need to, but that speaks to, I think you're speaking towards um, you know, the city council and, and past stated you know, goals going into you know, uh, negotiation and salary studies of where they want to see certain either classifications if it's you know sometimes uh, there's um, single bargaining units that we're looking at um, and to see where they want to peg uh, city employees at um, that's going to be something for council to take a look at um, as we prepare for the next round of negotiations uh, if that's still going to be the compensation philosophy the council wants to take. Thanks. Can is, is Councillor Carson or Councillor Chapman interested in making any statement? I I, I would just say um, we are trying to 
pay our uh, enter collective bargaining um, and live up to the requirements of the law to bargain fairly uh, with our employees. We are in a situation right now, um, at least for the next six months, where we have labor peace, where we are in agreements, multi-year agreements with every one of our bargaining units. And I would point out that we, in all of those agreements, we're able to achieve cost sharing on pension costs to a degree, I don't know if any other community has done achieved what we've done to, to help uh, protect us from fiscal uncertainty. Um, if we get a bill from CalPERS that is larger than projected, um, that, that triggers employees contributing more out of their side of the paycheck. If we get a, a surprise the other way that has benefited the city, the contract provisions have worked to share some of that benefit with, with the employees. That brackets us with a zone of greater fiscal stability that makes it better to run this, easier to run this city. Um, and, you know, it was a big change for us to achieve an agreement with all of our bargaining units at the same time and, and multi-year agreements at that. Um, we know, of course, that there are very significant challenges ahead, especially if we have inflation and recession at the same time. So, uh, we do need to move forward very carefully, not only in negotiations with the people who make the city work, but new commitments for programs. Um, when we are already in a place where, as you heard from Bob Leland a couple of weeks ago, we've made significant progress. Things have been moving in the right direction in redu reducing our long-term uh, funding gap. But Bob was also very clear, we still aren't, don't have all the resources to pay for everything. So adding new program on top of that, um, if you don't have a new funding source, or an offsetting reduction to pay for it, um, it'll be a challenge. And so we have to look at the cost of labor in that context. Okay, thank you. Um, just with an eye on time, current, uh, sorry, Commissioner Suthi, uh, do you want to, you're the only person I think hasn't said anything. Are you, would you like to say anything or? I have no questions or comments really on, on this one. Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank uh, Chris and uh, Elena and Kelly for the informative information they've provided. Um, and we need to ask for public comment, Mr. Commissioner Bremen. And, uh, and, Segue to uh, public comment, please. Thank you. Um, for those on Zoom, uh, please uh, raise hand. Um, if you're on the phone, please dial star nine if you'd like to make a public comment. And we do not have anybody. Okay, thank you. All right, um, let's see, moving to the next item. So trying to, see us through to an 8.30 finish unless we need more time and everybody agrees. Uh, we've got to hopefully almost the, the last thing on what is it that we hope to achieve and how we're gonna get there, uh, also known as the strategic planning piece. Uh, and then some time uh, for the long range calendar, uh, the commission and staff communication and long range calendar. So uh, can somebody load up the, the, the very small deck? Um, oh, before we begin, I see David, you've got your hand up. Oh, the hand has been received. You're, um, you're on mute though. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ezra. I just wanted to ask 
Uh, was there uh, any desire to try to get uh, a collective view on, on that presentation or recommendations, or do you think that was beyond the scope of the agenda item? Uh, we all got, I think, a chance to add our comments and two cents, but I don't know if anything came out of it in terms of, of uh, steps or recommendations, and maybe the, that flows into the next agenda item, I'm not sure, but just pose that to you and to the others. Well, thank you for the question. I mean, I often, like, as you know, <laughs> like to see if we can make a statement. Um, I, um, the only thing I would say is I sort of felt like this presentation was part of um, a process of getting information, discovering information, so they can feed into one of these sub these these task forces um, who would take it away. But I have I personally have no objective if somebody wants to to do that. The only other issue, though, David, we I wasn't planning on doing that, and maybe I would have tried to um, rein in our discussion a bit more because I do want to get through this this next piece. So. I don't know. Do you feel strongly? Do you have some? Does anybody have something they want to put forward, and we can move this quickly? Um, we can always bring it back next week too. Uh, Donna, I think that's a real hand you've got up. I thought it was a really helpful uh, presentation, and the questions were great. And I, I thought that it just really provided a great segue into this next segment because it gave us a lot of thoughts about what we might want to accomplish next so i don't know that we need to take my thought is we don't need to take any action on this specific item but just move into our planning session that would be my thought thank you anybody else want to well I, the point that i got out of it um which i've already mentioned but i i i would put this as a possible um report conversation staff to actually describe what these vacancies are doing to city work outputs. And if it's just a narrative discussion, I think that would be valuable for folks to know and to see, see the, the kind of problems this is causing. The other thing, which would probably be beyond the scope of this um, committee, but a commission would be to see if there's any possibility for commission, some other commission, if not this one, to engage to help with recruitment in some way. Are there different ways that, that, that commissions can sing the praises of public service and the value of working for the city of Davis? And whether that's on campus at UC Davis or community colleges, I don't know, but it seems like there, there's a role there to get that out. And uh, I'm sure staff is limited on times doing some of that, but may, maybe there, there's some help that could be can provided through the commission effort and um, describing some career opportunities. So I think that's valuable. And I think your point, Ezra, on questions relating to exits, I, I, I had kind of the same thought, didn't want to go there, but you know, I think there really needs to be some soul searching with the city about losing uh, folks if that's happening. So retirements are one thing, but people uh, going to um, a parallel position in another public agency, yeah, that's another. And going to the private sector, that's another reason. But really to take a hard look on that and is the culture positive, people really wanna work for the city, but also um, is there little things we can do like maybe treat, uh, tweaking that recruitment policy, it sounds, I'm sorry, recruitment, remote work policy uh, to make it kind of stand out as a deciding factor. Cause I think that is gonna be maybe a way to tip recruitment in our favor, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, that's what I would throw out is, is some, some possibilities and maybe we could we could bring this back another time if people are so inclined. But those those are my 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 key three summary points. Well, Paul's already. Put... I just wanted to say one thing. I think qualifying what the um, what the negative impact of for each department is based on what the vacancy is and what reduction in capability they have is is something that would be would be fairly valuable because we do run into sometimes occasions where something can't move forward because the lack of lack of you know staff availability and then we've had that come up before as well um so i could i could support some qualification i think quantifying might be difficult 
Well, could I suggest that whoever is interested when we get to the next session, sort of put, put their hand up. I think Commissioner Jacobs already has at least one volunteer and maybe it was Commissioner Sandino, but. Um, so I, I, I just wanna add real, real fast. I think one thing that we would be remiss is I agree with everything Commissioner Sandino is saying, but the, the other thing is the, the more there are vacancies and the more work that is put upon individuals in positions that remain may be contributing to people leaving. And so if we're gonna look at that, I think we should look at that as well. Thank you, sorry, low battery. All right, well, I'd like to move on to the next the next item. I think um, with the, the sort of uh, subcommittee that, that that Commissioner Jacobs is, is, is leading, um, all of this would be great to, or the amount that you think is relevant for our mandate would be great to see taken forward. So with that, let's go to the next um, the next agenda item. I would like to start with uh, public comment because there, there were materials that were posted. If we have any public comment, let's, let's uh, hear it now. Then, um, then I'll sort of go over it, I think relatively quickly, hopefully, and then we can have a good, some discussion with with the the time well ideally in around 30 minutes or less um yeah so let's start with that uh can we go to public comment please of course so for those on uh zoom please um dial um star nine um or uh, do a raise hand uh, function and uh, um let's see do we have any speakers um i do not see anyone wishing to speak no public Great. comment okay so let's turning to the agenda um in terms of a recap uh it was i uh, really appreciate everybody's uh, contribution uh during the previous session i think um, we had a good discussion around the potential strategic issues uh that we could be focusing on um and also an, an initial indication of what uh, areas people were interested in, um, because there are more things than we can do. And so really having people want to take something up and be passionate about it, I think is really gonna be a secret to success as is the collective support of this group um, and, and, and um, as well as the, uh, the staff and, uh, and the council ultimately, and, and trying to scope and focus on those areas where we can all make a contribution rather than find our efforts um, dissipate or in conflict. Uh, so that's really what I'm, I'm trying to support the facilitation of here with your cooperation. So one of the key things uh, that I was sent away to do was to meet with the, um, uh, the council reps. Um, and I had met previously with council, Councillor uh, Carson and I was able to meet with Councillor uh, Chapman in the, in the meanwhile. Um, and I think we'll see those conversations reflected in um, uh, in the updated agenda. But since you're here, uh, Councilor, Councilor Carson, if, if there's anything you think I've missed because our discussion was uh, some time ago, please do, do bring them up. Well, I, I just, th two quick points. One is I think woven into the thread of what I see in, in the summary um, is one of the, one of the critical things to, to the extent that this commission can identify specific new revenue sources or specific efficiencies in city government that we could use to help address our fiscal gap. I think those are valuable things for this city. Um, and this commission has at times made very significant contributions along those lines. So um anything on that area i think is is of great value um i also think because economic development is still going to be one of the most important avenues by some means to generate the revenue we, we need to run this city um you know it may be a time to pivot uh measure h did not pass what strategies, uh, in addition to our downtown plan that I certainly think fits within this wheelhouse, 
what else could we or should we be doing to generate um, uh, business and jobs, but also in particular business and jobs that would generate revenue to run Davis? Um, those are two generic areas that I think are critical to the future financial health of this city. Thank you. All right, if we could turn to the next uh, the next slide. So just on a recap, again, for me as a as a resource manager and as as a chair uh, for this period, uh, I really want to contribute by helping us be as as um, efficient and organized and effective as possible. And 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 through that, and I do have a, 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 a I like planning. Uh, is really making sure that we're all aligned and, and focused on what we want to be focused on. Um, one of the things that came out has come out over the last period is we think on average we can we can do about four hours per week. Uh, you know, on a week where we've got a meeting, you're already spending two plus hours in the meeting plus another hour, sometimes more, reading material. So it only re uh, really leaves um, three three other weeks. And I know you know life intervenes and we've got to go on vacation and stuff. So maybe four hours might even be a bit optimistic. Um, but really, <clears throat> my hope is we go through and we validate the, the list of, of issues that we all sort of put our hands up to take a, a fair share of, of leadership and support, um, and then sort of get get on our horses, so to speak, and uh, and and start trying to um, to close out or address these issues uh, together, uh, and and ultimately bring things uh, to the council that have our support, support of staff, and will hopefully be supported by by council. Um, the final thing was that there was interest in council feedback on strategic initiatives. You, you've heard from uh, Councilman Carson again, uh, and I think Councilman uh, Chapman's not on the call anymore, um, but I, I'll, I'll show you exactly what was added based on the discussion with him. All right, next, uh, next slide, please. So one of the things I was able to do based on the work we did last time uh, was to sort of group uh, the discussion. And again, I may have gotten this wrong. We haven't, we'll, we'll see through the minutes, but this is the opportunity to say, hey, I really think you missed dot point, you know, a dot point, or um, I'd like to discuss any of these things. But at a high level, it seemed the themes were around controlling costs. Uh, and <clears throat> I put the compensation competitiveness uh, in, in that section. Um, supporting affordable housing, that came through pretty loud and clear that that's something I think uh, we share uh, in, in wanting to uh, somehow contribute to uh, delivering quality infrastructure uh, and finding new revenues. Now within that, I've, um, I've put some uh, additional meta information in there. One, if, if something was added since our last meeting, um, I put it in gray, you can see under support affordable housing, uh, there is this uh, um, potential to support a review of the city needs assessment and surplus optimization. And that, that was via the discussion with Councilman uh, Chapman about potentially uh, looking at um, existing city property, uh, figuring out, you know, is it surplus to needs or maybe there's a different way of configuring it and getting ready access to property that can be um, uh, repurposed um, for, for, for uh, I guess, community objectives. So that's one thing. Um, and then another one was just around general plan best practice. Uh, my, own, my own reflections on the general plan is I think it's been 15 or 20 years and I sort of feel like it's out there about five years in the future. I know that the plan, that the schedule is a bit more than that, but that might be something. And the reason why I think it falls in, in our area is uh, until you have an updated general plan, you, you can't really, start charging different rates for infrastructure impacts. You need that to be able to reassess what the contribution is from, from incoming projects, notwithstanding that that might reduce their economics. But those are the two things that were added and those were based on, on the discussion uh, that I was able to have. Um, although if I got it wrong, it's all on me. Uh, Josh is not here to, sorry, uh, Councilman Chapman is not here to defend himself. Um, I think, so the other things, things that are in blue, I feel like we've got some carriage of, uh, that people have expressed an interest, or, or maybe I feel like they, um, they could potentially um, be, be already uh, spoken for. 
Uh, and then there is um, bold that there's an existing subcommittee uh, task force. Uh, sorry, I, I made a slight error there. So blue indicates that we actually have thought that we could go to, to staff and, 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 and get some information from them in a future presentation. Uh, and really, I, I, the way I sort of see this, and this will be in the next process slide, that if we sort of agree on the topics, we can then try and line up the briefing from the city so we get all the facts and we have a chance to, to, to discuss uh, any questions that we have. Um, then the, the, the subcommittees uh, can go away and do any associated investigation, analysis, research, uh, and then bring it back uh, to the group. Thank you. Um, uh, so that that's um, that was the the sort of thinking. Can we go back to the other slide, though? Uh, and so part of this is let's agree what's in scope, um, and then from there I can work uh, with the staff to sort of bring as much as we can into the meetings to to get briefed on that. Um, yeah. So. That's basically what I wanted to say about this slide. Let me move forward to the next one and then I think we'll, we'll do a discussion once we get through there. There's only three slides. Um, so one of the other conversations that um, I had as part of the discussions with the uh, uh, council reps uh, was, you know, how can we work and, and how does council really want the commission to deliver recommendations yeah you know what what is what is most useful because we can't do everything right we we can't do these deep dives on things like uh what is the impact of not having enough staff you know is it really a cost savings that sort of stuff so what can we do what is a what is a process that we could follow that's going to get the best out you know it's going to be fit for purpose and so this is going to work all the time uh, but it seemed to resonate and um uh and and, and the basic way it worked is, you know, if what we can do is basically chase down or, or investigate issues and see, is there a reason to take this forward to, 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 to do more? Um, and if we, and then that could be handed off to staff, it could be handed off to, I, I hate to say it, a consultant. Um, but, you know, if we can do the legwork to just sort of see uh, if, there's, if there's a reason to go further. And so I've sort of, I'll put that out there for discussion. You know, if everybody sees that as, a, as maybe a useful model that can be used and applied when it's useful, but I would I would stress that there's a range of things we look at. We look at are the economics of a particular project um, positive. I don't think that fits within this framework. But a lot of what we're doing in terms of chasing down strategic issues on that previous slide uh, is really around. Let's go get some more information. Let's understand what we currently know. Let's see what you know. Let's do some benchmarking or, or gathering of information. Um, and then let's bring it back and, and see if we can make a recommendation. And that make a recommendation might be, hey, do nothing. There's, there's nothing. There's no. There's nothing. There's nothing we can agree on, or we don't think there's anything to do. Or we can make recommendations about potential new policies or further work. So that's that's what this is about. Um, and I think if we if we if we follow a process like this, it's going to foster our fellow commissioner support. It's going to foster city staff support because. It starts, and, and this was something I would like to credit uh, Donna with doing, at least with my in my experience, sorry, Commissioner Neville, um, was to say, look, it's really important that we always engage with staff and that we really bring that back and, and have done our homework and we don't don't come to the uh, to the to the FDC not having done that. So that's something that we sort of put there at the at the front. Um, uh, and then by doing that, right, we'll have the right information. We'll we'll um, we'll have done our homework, uh, and that will hopefully foster foster uh, city council support. And then with all that support, we'll hopefully be able to contribute something that's taken forward. All right. Let, oh, uh, Commissioner Sufi. I have a quick question. Can we go to the slide earlier, keeping this in mind? Yep. So. So was the idea that essentially, um, given we would have basically some sort of a conversation on some of these items, that we would then focus on like all the commissioners have like a, we're all focused on controlling costs, for example, first, we get the appropriate uh, meetings or appropriate um, staff um, input on some of these items. And then we would just break up into like, three different groups tackling different topics under controlling costs just keep the theme constant but then there's subgroups under that 
I didn't I didn't mean to put it in any particular order. I, I felt like we could organize the different key issues under themes. Um, mm -hmm. I was expecting that people that we do want to get um, staff to come and, and, and tell us what, what we need to know as much as possible, but that, you know, we don't have to wait for that. I mean, people, people can put their hand. I, I think the main thing is that we all take a fair share of, you know, every, everybody pulling, you know, doing a little bit of rowing um, and supporting other people doing rowing and, and we'll, we'll get through these. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Just uh, next one. And we're almost, almost done then. Or at least with the presentation, we're gonna have a good a good discussion. Uh, next 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 two maybe. Next one, please. Uh, just to, actually, this is really just to repeat. These are the operational things that are gonna be here, and um, they come up cyclically, um, or uh, they've already been assigned. In the case of the the subcommittee that I cannot speak its name. Uh, Downtown plan, I actually think that we've got people assigned or do we have to reassign that actually? That's something that we probably should speak to because um, Commissioner Busby's no longer with us. Um, anyway, I got to check it on that. He's not on that subcommittee. Okay. Um, Michael and I are on that. Thank you. He, yeah, he kind of stepped down from that. Okay. All right, so that's covered. All right, next slide, please. Oh, not that one, that one. So I'm hoping if we can go through and, and sort of uh, be 90% sure about what, you know, what we want to do as a team, um, and then to the extent possible, uh, have everybody sort of sign up for one thing to lead and maybe two things to support. Uh, that, you know, that's one meeting a week, basically, uh, for the three that are not, not meetings where we show up. Uh, and then with that, I can sort of pull together sort of a, a, a Gantt chart of, of, of how this might look um, and sort of give us the vision of, you know, what we can, what we could be seeing in, in nine months time in, in rough terms. All right, got lots of questions. Uh, sorry, I don't know who, who started. Um, Michael was first. Great, thank you. Um, I think for the most part, I'm, I'm okay with this. Um, the one thing that I would just, say that I think we, people's ability to uh, contribute ebbs and flows based on things in their own lives and their own work. Um, and I think we need to be a little bit realistic about that. I think, you know, striving for one meeting a week might be a little bit on, on the high side. I think we can, say you know do do one thing in between meetings i think is reasonable from from my experience but if it if it, it becomes every week or in some cases you know we'll have two two meetings or three meetings in a week um you know that can that can become an, an issue so I, I would put that out there and then i would i would also say like i i see in in this discussion wanting to impact policy which i understand and support um but there are some you know house chore things that i think are really important functions um for instance reviewing the audit and reviewing the budget i, I think they're really the core functions of, of this committee as i i see it and so as we we would you know add on other things i i don't think we can do that at the expense of those core functions. So those are just the the two things that I would say. Like I I, I don't think it should be you know a, um, an expectation that you go every, every week to a meeting and we have a subcommittee meeting every week. I th I think it needs to be as needed and people can can show as as needed and that you know when there is a high priority issue, obviously we need to be in that. But I I think we run the risk of sort of decreasing participation if we have too much of it. And so um, that's that's all. Sorry, just so I don't have to, thank you for your, your comment. Um, I got the audit, what was the other thing? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think really okay. it, as I look at, I look at the committee reviewing the audit as a core, 
function of the committee and passing a review of it. Like, I think, you know, whenever that comes out, it's a core function that we all are going to have to spend time reading that, right? And that gets to my other point. If I'm going to read an audit, that's what I'm going to do with my volunteer two or three hours for that week. And then adding another meeting on top of that, I, it becomes a problem. No, and, and I, that, that's why I wanted to have these other operational things, uh, just to recognize that. Um, but no, I, I appreciate your, your, um, your statement. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Commissioner Neville. Thank you, Ezra. So, do you mind going back just two slides to that one that Gakern had asked you to show again? That one, thank you. So I want to just throw out a thought. Um, I actually agree with Michael as well about what our core, you know, what one of our really important roles is to review the budget and the audit, and that takes some time. I'm just going to share with you sort of a, a series of thoughts I have when I look at this list. Um, and it's sort of the reason I have these thoughts comes from my experience working in a, a government setting where we did performance audits of government agencies and made improvements for how they could do things better. And I will just say, this is an extraordinarily ambitious list. This is a really big, big list. And, and so I'm all about really taking on what I think we can reasonably manage, first of all. And the other thing too, is I read this list and I read kind of the bulleted points. Some of the bulleted points are expressed as sort of topics. Some are expressed as goals, as it, with a verb like optimize or deliver or whatever. The way that when I was working in this world of performance auditing, the way we would approach things like this is, we first of all would identify just what the problem was and then if we were going to tackle the problem, we started with the big picture question or questions. Things were presented to us in the form of questions. What exactly is it we are trying to know? What are we trying to determine about procurement strategy? And I'll just take a simple example, right? Does the city's current procurement policies promote efficiency and use, efficient use of resources or whatever? whatever the question is, but having a question and then breaking it down into more discrete detailed questions really helps you understand what you're trying to do. So that's one other thought I have about this list, but also just that it is really overly ambitious. If as a commission, if we were gonna tackle three big picture questions in the coming year, that would be a lot. That's my thought. And I'll just throw that out there, given everyone's time constraints, resources, the complexity of the issue. So really narrowing it down, focusing on what's really achievable, and then also making sure that we are not duplicating ongoing city staff efforts. Because that's a key thing for me is knowing what's, what analysis is being done in each of these areas already before we undertake some kind of venture. Those are all thoughts I would throw out there. Um, it's, I, I very much appreciate that you put this list together, um, but I just think we've, it's pretty ambitious. No, thank you. I, and I, I, I put the list out here, um, trying to listen to what everybody says are potential issues, not putting rankings on them, but, you know, ultimately we do ideally will focus on what we and, and council and everybody else considers the most important things, right? Then you can we can be more sure about that. So, um, you know, it's, it's very much. It's it's a great way to facilitate the discussion. And it please everyone else is feel free to call things out or and continue the, the the conversation. But so far, you know, I'm uh, getting uh, feedback that, um, yeah, we need to really dial down uh, what we what we're what we're aiming to do. Um, largely just. Well, let's dial down. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. I think um, I'm uh, sorry. I don't know if it was Paul right. first. Thank you. Yeah, I I just want to say that one thing that you need to take into account is that to get information requires very often the staff to give it to you, and that means staff time. And as David and I and David more than I, because he was doing this before I joined him in this continuing effort to 
look at procurement policies, uh, it, it can take a very, very long time to get information. And I'm not faulting staff necessarily uh, for that because they're busy, they're doing lots of things. And we have no other source of information. I mean, in other words, if you wanna understand what the city is doing or not doing, what its policies are, you have to go to the staff and ask them, and that's going to require their time. So I would agree with Donna. I think we need to focus on the things on your list, Ezra, that where we can get information reasonably uh, efficiently and where we can have an impact. I think I agree with both those. Um, those points, but I just think it, you, I think it can just be very excruciating and, and frustrating when the, the numbers and the, the policies that you need are not readily available and that you have to insist with, that staff provide them. And because as we now know, we have lots of vacancies and we have lots of turnover and what we're asking for takes time. Uh, that's my only point really. And I don't mean to be so negative about it, but I think if we can focus on those things that we can accomplish and that are important and give some priority to all this, uh, I think we're, we're better, uh, we'll be better able to have an impact. Great, thank you. And I just want to I, uh, you called them my list, but I'm hoping that this list just really reflects the conversations we've been having. <laughs> um, so my comment about this, I like how it like really frames everything that we've been doing some at some level or another, there is something on here that somebody on this in this commission has worked towards. I think one of the challenges we've had as a commission over the past couple years is that we all we do take our workloads very fragmented. So we come into these general meetings where we don't really discuss what our different subcommittees were doing, even though we've had subcommittee times. And then we go off and we do our subcommittee responsibilities, um, which vary depending on subcommittees, however much that actually is. And then we come back with an update. I think that being able to lay out the, the various strategic goals here, or at least these strategic umbrellas, and then just saying, okay, you know what, maybe finishing one thing is better than getting started on a bunch of things and kind of corralling the entirety of the commission into saying, okay, well, these are the, we're going to focus on this one umbrella and hit these major points. And then we can all line up our Gaunt charts, our, our work plans with one another. So that when we do come back into these general meetings, right, we all have something and maybe something that someone else has been working on in their subcommittee helps someone else and we're all free to discuss all these things in our general meetings so what i would say like it's nice seeing all this i think this commission kind of needs to determine if we were to take this route forward is which one of these do we prioritize as number one i.e controlling costs affordable housing delivering quality infrastructure finding new revenue like agree on the one thing and then just restructure all of our work based on that so that's that's my suggestion and thought. Thank you, Commissioner Sufi. Um, Commissioner Gus, get your hand up. Yeah, um, I, I took a second look at it, and I think what I, I see here is there's really three issues that, that the commission grapples with, which is how to find new revenue, how to solve the housing issue, um, which probably is above all of our pay grades, but maybe we can contribute to that. And, and how to develop infrastructure while also controlling costs. And because I think cost is a big part of the infrastructure discussion. And I think I think those are economic development gets into at least the revenue 
portion of it, as Councilman Carson rightly mentioned. Um, and so I think those are, are, are the three is issues really that I say we've been grappling with at least since I've been on the commission. And I think maybe it would be more useful to sort of view the frame through, through those issues that could still include all of this. But I think when we look at it sort of in, in this format, it, it looks like a lot when really, if it's you know something that needs to be considered as part of an affordable housing study or et cetera, or infrastructure, or you know, finding new revenue, all of the components can be housed within those those three issues. I think, you know, obviously, again, we we have to do more than than that. But I agree that I think we need to focus on sort of a limited number of things. I I would say between three would be the maximum, and I kind of agree with uh, the previous commissioner that it, it would be. Uh, Commissioner Gukern, uh, it would be, you know, one I ideal, but um, I, I think it would probably be pretty hard for us to choose between those three issues. And I'm just noticing it is those three issues. So I'm, maybe that's a different way to look at it that could help people. Okay. Um, well, a couple of ideas are for just, uh, I wish I had numbers on these now so we could you know uh, of these so a couple of things you just know right we have the procurement subcommittee already established a local purchase preference that's already established and i do even have news uh this this month um the rest of the oh and i, I think um the compensation is also got a, a subcommittee for it so we already have three things on the go at the moment <clears throat> um and i guess i'll <clears throat> pardon me I mean, do we want to do we want to just sort of uh, show of hands what we think this this group thinks is the um, the next most important thing? I just want to correct Commissioner Sufi. Um, I, I sort of should have said last name and not first name in the last one. So sorry about that. Commissioner, Sufi. thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Commissioner Sufi. Um, so honestly, I think that the. Um, delivery capacity for the delivery of the quality infrastructure that's a um that could go under co controlling costs just because it's a uh it is a there's a projected cost and then there's an actual cost and just kind of comparing what that is and also comparing the projected delivery date and the projected and the actual delivery date I envision that being the totality of that report, you know, just itemized all these projects, how, how far over budget and how far over time they were. And, and that kind of gives you a relative cost overrun on an annual basis that you can compare to some of these other budget items. Um, it's not really under deliver. It, it is under delivering quality infrastructure, but I could, I could see myself working on that and also doing it under a controlled cost perspective. Uh, and I, so I had a slightly different understanding. I mean, I, I knew that you were interested in the controlling cost. Um, I was thinking we've already approved all this money. It's sitting there doing nothing. It certainly isn't giving me new sidewalks. Uh, and so I thought that, you know, looking at delivery capacity delivered more value to the, com the community with dollars that are already there and available. Um, so it's mm. a different perspective. Um, I see that I misinterpreted. No, it was yours, so I misinterpreted. So there, there was that, but I was just thinking, so maybe delivery capacity, I hadn't quite understood correctly. This would be more like just a assessment of assessment of, of past projects is basically what I'm thinking. And that would be a, under a section yeah. for controlling costs. Okay. Well, I, I'm a little bit, I have to say, I'm a little bit stomped at the best way forward here. I mean, I'm hearing loud and clear, we need to get a shorter list. Uh, we need to really focus on the top three. I'm happy with the top three. I mean, we already have three things going though. And, and do we want to say, look, let's get behind closing these things out. I mean, the, the procurement uh, strategy, we haven't come to the top the time to, to talk to that. Um, 
uh, and, and the local bridges. I'm hoping to have that turned around by the next meeting um, and then hopefully that'll go away. Uh, and then, you know, the, the compensation one's just getting started. So sorry, I didn't know who put their hand up again first. Okay, it's you, Commissioner Gus. Okay, um, I, I, I just, I don't know if I wanna make this a motion or not, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out here. I think um, maybe it would be useful if we could have sort of a, a small subcommittee I think maybe Commissioner Sufi and Commissioner Neville, as well as um, Chair Chair Ezra, uh, um, the, and I'm having a hard time seeing people's last names, and I I can remember everybody's first names, but not last names, so I'm sorry about that. Um, to sort of work on maybe paring this down, because I think the as it comes to the whole group it's one person trying to figure out how to include everybody's idea, but maybe everybody's idea doesn't need to be included or can be included in a different way where if you have three people instead of one talking about it, maybe it would be easier to get it to be a little bit narrower. So that's just a thought. And if people are, are interested in that, I'd be happy to make a motion. And if not, I'd be happy not to. Well, seems like uh, that motion dies for lack of a second, but that's okay. We got just a comment. That I think that like um, in this is this is more like a would it just be better off if we went ahead and delegated responsibility rather than got buy in for responsibility and just said hey if we if we let's come back with some information about this next meeting. Um, is is that that would kind of go along the lines of what Commissioner Gus is saying? I wouldn't say that I necessarily disagree with that, um, but yeah, it then your how much each individual feels like they actually are being buying into it will be a lot less. But you know, it may be more productive, so I would not be opposed to it. Yeah, I I, I think I I feel heard, and like I know that all three any anybody that we put on on that subcommittee will will have taken the account of the people who, who weren't into into it and I, like i think it the commission is large enough and like commissioner axe isn't even here tonight so you know that's some, some another perspective that we need to have and it's i i think Sometimes planning process need a, lead, a, 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 a sort of a, a leader to come back and then it can be ratified by the group. We could still suggest edits at the next meeting, but I think we've been planning for long enough that we sort of need a final draft. My two cents is if we have three people together, at least we've got three votes uh, in the direction um, and we're a bit further um, than, than you know, I'd not a lot of, not a lot of, well, the other idea I had, and I should have thought of this earlier, was to actually have a voting, um, some kind of voting voting tool that allowed us to quickly just sort of tag what we thought were the top three. That's the other way of doing it. Um, but I don't have that tool. Just, we just raise our hands. Yeah, let's do that. Let's try that and see if it gets us anywhere, because um, that'll be quick. Uh, and then we will uh, potentially then go to go to a subcommittee. We'll do a subcommittee to go to the subcommittee. All right. Um, can everybody? So just mind if I call people out uh, in order? Ezra. Yep. I'm so sorry to have to be the Brown Act cop, but because we're meeting virtually, we have to do votes by roll call. Unless well, Kelly disagrees, Kelly can override me. It's not. It's not a vote yet, right? I'm just trying to get what the count is. And then once we have the count, we can vote on it by roll call. I actually agree with Commissioner Neville and will be abstaining from this because I do think it's a Brown Act issue. It's unfortunate, but I this is why I'm looking forward to in-person meeting. Kelly, any input? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of an easier way that you guys could could do could. this um 
I mean, I, th I think each person could just say out loud their top three one at a time. And then um, we can, Elena and Bowen and I can make note of that, and see where that gets us. I didn't see that. that sorry, just one sec, Commissioner Jacobs, but I didn't think all we're doing is trying to get on the record what we think the top three is, and then we can actually vote on whoever gets the most votes. We then have a vote on that. Donna? I, was this on the agenda as for possible action? Because if it wasn't, then we can't take that. It's a planning finalizing work I, plan I don't what this is if we're not acting on it yeah sorry commissioner jacobs you've had your hand up i just i just wonder if you couldn't ezra you uh, meet with your your vice chair and our past chair and suggest a list of, suggest your put this in some priority uh put Put this in order of priority at, based on our discussion today and we can bring it up as a formal matter next next time second uh, uh, I, uh, i'm not even sure i'm not even sure you need a vote on that i think that's part of your discretion as chair to uh, organize us and get us to think. I mean, we can obviously as a commission overrule it. The public can come in and say, you forgot X or Y. You put too much emphasis on Z. Uh, it's just a suggestion to get us moving along. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Sufi? Uh, I guess at this, situ at this crossroads, we could just have myself say one thing, Donna say one thing, you yourself say one thing, and that's you what we go with at this point. Like, my I'm opting for controlling costs. I love cutting costs. So I've said that since day one. Commissioner Neville, can I get your input, please? I sure and I think it's totally fair game just to go around the, the room and get people's priorities. Um uh, affordable housing and finding new revenue would have been my top two. Thank you. Um so you can can we just if 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 the, the lawyer in the room and the the associate um, general manager are, are saying we're okay, I would like to just quickly go around the room and get the the top three. Kelly. If, if you want to go around and call on people and ask what their their top one, two, three, whatever are, um, and then see where where the commission is at that point, then you can decide if you want to take a vote on something or not. Okay, great. And and uh, Commissioner Sandino, I also I think you're the other lawyer in the room, but I could be wrong. Um, all right, let's do that. Uh, so we had feedback from uh, from Commissioner Neville and Commissioner Sufi. Um, if you can go any deeper on the dot points, that would be, I think, good too. But if not, that's okay. Um, I'm just going to go around on the people that I had on my screen. Uh, Commissioner Sandino, would you mind weighing in? Yeah, I'd be happy to weigh in. I missed the last meeting, as you know, and I sent an email with my my thoughts, um, which I was going to stay quiet on this one, but since you asked, um, you know, my, my, I just start with my concerns about this is I'm not sure what the ask is for the commissioners, what the deliverable are. Are you looking for a report for each one of these, a written report? Are you looking for an oral report? Are you looking for coordination with staff? Are you looking for interaction with stakeholders, city residents? So, so with that, I don't know what the game plan is for each of these bullets. As I as I try to suggest, I, I'm going to have limited time with uh, writing reports. I want to finish the current report that Paul and I are working on relating to contracts. But with that said, I'm interested in uh, affordable housing as 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 a priority. But I'm going to suggest it's incredibly complicated, and there's other commissions that have already written reports and have gone this direction. So you know, this is part of part of the challenge. 
we're not doing this in a vacuum. We have to coordinate. So that, that'll be my, my first one. Um, uh, the, the second one that I'm interested in would be controlling costs. Uh, but I wanted to move you know, to a next area after contracts into some other cost containment area. So that's number two for me. And then uh, the, the third one, if I had, I had, I had to pick one, um, I, I would say um, focusing on the infrastructure. I think finding new revenue is pretty hard. So those would be my three. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gus. Um, I, I'm going to answer this in what I feel I'm qualified to contribute to the commission, not necessarily um, what should be the priorities of the commission. And I think maybe, maybe if we did that in the future, we would have less of a problem of this discussion. I think I'm qualified um, to work on finding new revenue, both from the economic development side, because I, I work for the economic development agency, the state, and have worked in other states' economic development, the ecosystems. Uh, and and um, I also think I'm qualified uh, in delivering quality infrastructure and maybe a little bit in affordable housing, but I concur with Commissioner Sandino's point that, you know, that's an issue that has a lot of cooks in the kitchen and I don't need, don't need to be the 12th cook in the kitchen if people are already there. Um, so um, those are the two things I'd be interested in, in contributing to. And I would, you know, specifically say, I notice grant opportunities under uh, finding new revenue, uh, definitely have experience there. Um, and I would, um, I would be interested in knowing, obviously not tonight, how broad we wanna take that or how narrow or project specific it is. Um, but those are the things that interest me the most on the list. Thank you. Um, next in my circle is Commissioner Jacobs. Yeah, um, I, I think maybe the top issue for me would be revenue opportunities. And that would include economic development. Now, how you approach that is, uh, and get a real, get your handle on at least a piece of it is not gonna be easy, I think. But I think it's worth looking at at least some aspect of it and maybe coming up with some ideas. Uh, not on your list is the whole idea of the city's communication with the public. Um, and I'm thinking of that in terms of compensate the compensation, looking at compensation. I think we learned a lot tonight hearing from HR about where, how they peg compensation to what 5% below the median. And yet we have people saying our staff is publicly producing papers using data that I'm not sure is sound, saying that they're overpaid, that their pay increases are much higher than inflation when you include all compensation and so on. Uh, I think it's worth looking at compensation. And as part of that, I think we could aid the city in its efforts to communicate how we're doing. And I guess that's, those two would be my top at the moment. Thank you. And I think I'm the, I think I'm the last person. Um, I mean, I got to finish off this finding new revenue. Uh, I think, I think the two that are um, of most interest and, uh, to me at the moment are really in the finding new revenue and the quality infrastructure. And one of the things um, that I would like to come back to the commission with is, is this harebrained scheme I have around a potential bond to, uh, to, secure, to secure financing on a long-term basis, but I got a lot more work to do to put this harebrained idea together. So those are my, that's where I, I guess land. All right, well, look, I don't, I think, um, leave this with me and, and, and Gukurin as the, um, as the coach, as the deputy chair uh, to come back and sort of use this to then 
develop up a, a, a set of a set of meetings into the future um, focused on these these areas and and we'll um, we'll move on to to, to to specific text for us. I mean we do have three already going, keeping in mind people's bandwidth. Um, we'll, I'll try and I'll chart us a course with all that information and, and everybody's help uh, so that we can we can do this sustainably. All right. Um, I just want to say I know we been kind of harsh on this as it often is in planning and been there, done that as a planner. And I, I know how much work has been put into it and, and don't think that any um, criticism of it is coming from other than we, we respect that work and, and we want to make sure that it can be as effective as possible. So um, really appreciate everything you've done. Uh, appreciate it, Commissioner Gus, but I really I see this as a, as a, as a, as a team. <laughs> We put a lot of effort into this. Let's. Uh, I think we've done a lot of talk. You know, we, we, I have a lot better understanding about where people are coming from, what's driving them, what the constraints are, uh, and hopefully that will make it um, my ability to uh, to, to to help um, coordinate us and, and, and move us in this direction. Okay, it's um eight forty five now. I'd like to I'd like to move on to the next um, uh, items, which are. Uh, commission and staff communication. Uh, but before we do, I think we go to um, public comment. Um, Commissioner Beeman, do not see anyone wanting to speak at this moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, then turning to this item, let's just go subcommittee by subcommittee. Um, we do have the the first, whoa, that's interesting. Uh, first stop point, uh, does Commissioner Sandino Jacobs have any uh, update on that? Still working. Optimistic, get something soon, but uh, we'll, we'll look and circle back and, and give you an update before the next meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Sandino. Is there anything that the that the commission can do to support your efforts? I mean, this is one of the things I was. I'm hoping that if we're all behind what we're doing, and you need any any official support or reiteration of how important this is to us, that we can lend that support. Well, thank you for that offer. Um, so I don't know how much time we want to talk about this, but. Um, um, you know, basically, you know, Paul and I could probably give our oral presentation. We had an oral presentation today on uh, on this on the status of vacancies. We could do something like that. We were hoping actually to get something that you could evaluate, and uh, also that staff could evaluate before we, we made it to you. So you could give us input as to whether or not we've got the right pathway. We're trying to do something that might have that's tangible and you can review, but uh, if, if that's not in the cards, it's fine. Um, as far as you know, somebody stepping up and engage with Paul and I to uh, um, work on a report, I, I would be fine with that. We put in a, a lot of time, but if somebody wanted to help, I could get Paul's opinion on this, but if somebody wanted to do that kind of heavy lifting, do it. I mean, this is back to my, my comment that to actually to do a deliverable, a tangible report takes a lot of work. So that's kind of it. So I would throw that out there. If somebody wants to join, join us, I, I'm, I don't think it's too late. You could um, perhaps uh, um, help with the writing or certainly do in the vetting. So that's my thoughts, but Paul should chime in too what he thinks. What's interesting is we've, We've gathered a lot of documents and we have a fair amount of information and we need to, and we've, we've done some sorting through it and we need to get down to the hard task of writing it. And at this point, I'm not sure anybody can help us, but, uh, <laughs> but I think we should write something and I think we should send it over to the staff for comment and to fill in any holes in it. And then I think we should send it to the commission with any recommendations we would have. And I'm not sure anyone coming in at this juncture would do anything but slow us down in my opinion, but it's my opinion. 
All right, well, I know that first paragraph is the hardest one. <laughs> okay, well, look, I think um, sounds, if anybody's interested, maybe reach out to, to, to Paul and David. Um, otherwise, it sounds like you guys are actually further along than I thought you, you might be. So well done and getting all that and you just got to put it pen to paper. And with, I have uh, six reports to deliver between now and the end of the month. So I, I feel your pain. Um, all right, uh, so economic impact and major development. Okay, so the update here is I've finally um, lining up a time with staff to go through uh, the proposal, which was my marching orders and I've been um, flat footed. So I appreciate Elena actually and credit to her for saying, hey, when do you wanna meet? Um, so that's now going again, once, um, once we have that meeting and I've got that input, I will make a, a further revision and then bring that back uh, and see uh, what the what the commission thinks. I mean, uh, anybody wants to be part of that, let us know. Um, we have a spare seat uh, since um, Commissioner Busby is is no longer in the sidecar. Uh, so another opportunity for anybody who has uh, got time and uh, and interest. Uh, moving on to the third dot point, um, downtown plan update. Are there any updates there, commissioners who are on it? Just for a second, the one that you were just discussing, if I could suggest that the part B of the, the subcommittee related to economic uh, impact of major development, that whole sub B, I think has been sort of mooted out by what we have since learned about development impact fees. So perhaps the commission wants to informally or formally modify the scope of that subcommittee and take it off the table because it's not work we're currently doing. So I, I don't know that we need to do a, a, a vote on that, but unless anybody wants to object, but just with the power of the pen, I think I'd like to edit that. I agree with you, Commissioner Neville. Let's focus on what, what, we're, what we're looking at now, which is just part A. <clears throat> you okay with that, Commissioner Sufi? Is it okay? Well, All right, we'll just take that as noted for next time's um, meeting <clears throat> agenda, please. All right, uh, next dot point. Yeah. Um, and it's really the same status that, that I had explained previously that even though Michael and I both reviewed the EIR, it's because this is a this EIR is a little bit unique in the way that we're changing our overall approach to land use from one of a zoning based approach to a form based code. Um, the EIR is not as specific as some EIs, EIRs are where you can really look at exactly what is going to happen in, you know, in the project. So it's, it still feels really premature at this point for me to be able to say what the economic impacts or fiscal impacts would be. It's not until things start to, proposals start to come in and things start to emerge that that will change. Okay. I agree. I, I, I think, um, I think that having looked at it, that it, you, you can see where it is, but I'm not confident. I could come up with a guess, but I'm not confident that that's going to be 100% accurate with my skill set, with a consultant skill set. Um, I think maybe it could be more accurate, and I'm interested in learning and reviewing those reports. But until we have them, I, I don't think we can take action. And maybe if you don't mind, Ezra, if um, Kelly, can you just remind us? I know the public comment period has closed on the EIR and when will it be coming to council for consideration? Is that happening pretty soon? The, um, the downtown plan. Yeah, the downtown plan is coming. I'm trying to think what it's, yes, it's coming in one of the upcoming December meetings. I just don't remember if it's the 6th or the 13th. Yes. So I think um, the we'll take a look at whatever the, the EIR consultants come up with for that meeting and maybe have something to report back in January is the report. Do you agree, Commissioner Neville? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's gonna change. The fiscal impacts aren't gonna change. It's gonna be focused really on, on the public comment and any responses that council will make in the revision in the document based on the comments. But sure, we can definitely keep our eyes on that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next is the Urban Forest Management Plan Review. Yeah, I went to the Tree Commission meeting, actually attended in person. Um, 
So just for um, understanding, though their meetings start at 5.30, and I think that one ended at close to 10.30. So they go on quite a ways. Um, and so I stayed for the whole thing. Uh, and so there's sort of two things. There's a there's a new urban forest plan that they're doing, and then there's a management plan that they're also doing, which are really kind of separate plans, but they're kind of related. And one's kind of being done by staff and one's being done by a consultant. And I think that they're, I'm just getting to the procurement. I think that um, there may have been some misunderstanding about the scope of what the consultant could and couldn't do. Um, so I think, you know, as we look at procurement and, and those issues, um, you know, making sure that commissions that are going to be working with consultants understand the limits of consultant scope, I think are really important for controlling costs. That was something that I noticed at that meeting where the commissioners wanted more from the consultants, but that more was going to cost, right? And so like, I think this commission especially you could do a better job of pointing out those requests come with a cost sometimes. Um, the plan itself is moving along pretty well. Um, there is some concern uh, as they're sort of trying to make the, the tree commission code living, living and breathing. There's been some con concern from the liaison from the public utilities commission the uh, landowners do not understand the tree code and therefore often inadvertently uh, violate the tree code because basically the city at some point in the past bought a whole bunch of trees, planted them in a whole bunch of yards with the stipulation that the tree had to remain there in perpetuity. And so someone who wasn't there when that happened and buys a house and it isn't explained to them then wants to take down the tree because it's falling over or whatever, but they have to go through the tree commission process to get that approved. And um, oftentimes people do that, you know, do what they want to do without asking the tree commission and that, that becomes a problem. Uh, so, and I, I think the, the, the tree department acknowledges that's a problem as well. Um, there is some interest from the Natural Resources Commission, um, specifically on uh, how much shade cover can reduce electricity unit, uh, ele electricity usage in summer months, protect the grid and conserve natural resources. Uh, I'm gonna mention, but it's not really um, anything that you have to recuse yourself for. They've discussed the climate action plan and how they interact with it uh, and the benefits of it are, are definitely there. Um, the, from the cost perspective, I think um, the, the, un, the, un, um, the unaddressed costs uh, would have to be um, the water costs. I don't from what I've seen from the plan to date, and it will be interesting to see the final presentation this Thursday, if anybody's interested. From what I've seen from the plan to date, the water cost really has not been addressed to my satisfaction at least. And um, you know, with what's going on on the Colorado River, uh, which is definitely an impact of climate change. And I'll just say, you know, it's far away from us here in Davis, but if the Colorado River goes below the level of for Lake Mead to be able to put out Hoover uh, Dam uh, electricity and they cut off water to Los Angeles, which is a possibility because it's at the end of the river. Do I think it will happen? No, but it's, it's, it's on a list of possible. Then Los Angeles is gonna need water from somewhere else in the state of California and it's gonna have to be from the North. And unless we're prepared for how much water is gonna cost in that scenario, which is closer than we think, um, we're gonna be in for a real surprise bill. And, and I 
I think there's concern from the Natural Resources Commission and the Public Utilities Commission as well about water cost. And it hasn't, trees are great. The forest we have here in Davis is amazing. We should do everything that we can to keep it. But there's cost associated with that specifically as related to water. And I have not seen that be well defined by the plan, but the final draft is due on Thursday and they've heard those comments. So we'll see what they have to say. And thank you. I should have warned you about the magic word, uh, Chairman Beeman. So sorry about that. It's all right. Um, so we have that as the next item, but I'd like to skip to the, like it's where it's 8.59. I don't really want to go over, um, but we will stay and we have to vote on going to the next item for this, by the way. So let me just jump to the bottom and then I'll hand it to uh, Commissioner Sufi to do the, the dot before. Um, can we talk uh, setting up structure to hold the strategic planning discussion subcommittee? I, I think we're, 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 we're done there. Um, or so there hasn't been um, any action taken. I was going to actually ask that uh, at least there would be a decision that if not vote, but at least a decision to disband it. But I just wanted to make sure we have um, some somewhat of a formal discussion to actually um, abandon that subcommittee now. Isn't that now so, the subcommittee to just yes. make a strategic plan? So unless it's continued, but um, sounds like maybe you guys changing the uh, who is part of the subcommittee, um, if I understood from earlier discussion. I thought we basically met initially to set this up. And um, so I thought that that. Yeah. So I thought that particular subcommittee was for the initial uh, discussion. Um, Commissioner Sufri just mentioned that there's going to be an, now a plan because you guys just talked about it on the prior item. So I just, I guess either we need to let it go or if the uh, scope is modified, we will adjust so. Uh, uh, Commissioner Neville, are you interested in, in, in meeting again on that or? I, I think that's kind of done. Yeah. Okay. Starting this process. I Great. So we'll call it done. Um, just if you can minute that, and next time in the minutes, we'll remove it. Yes. We'll okay. do that. And I do have one more question, Commissioner Beamer, before uh, we move on to the other um, subcommittee um, item. Um, there has been a discussion, I just want to clarify that about the compensation and uh, Commissioner Jacobs being part of it and reviewing something. Um, there hasn't been any formal committee, subcommittees set up for that. I just want to make sure uh, it's clear because there were comments that Commissioner Jacob is all, Jacob's already working on something. So I just want to clarify that there hasn't been any other subcommittee set up in terms of compensation review or uh, something like that. I think that, that you're, you're, you're correct. I think J Commissioner Jacobs had expressed uh, an interest in potentially um, lead, leading one, but also conscious he's already on another subcommittee. So um, I don't, okay. if it's all right with everyone, I would let, let's pause, let's push this to the next meeting and, and discuss what, That's fine. What, if, what if any subcommittees we need to, um, to set up next time. Yeah, I think it should be table. Okay. In the American sense. Um, right. So the final one, I'll turn this over to Commissioner Sufi and then go from there. When I put down my arm or hand, you're good to come back. Um, so with the climate action adaption plan, I believe it went to council. The last time date to edit was 11 or 10, 20, 10, 13, right after our last committee meeting. Um, in terms of that, I'm not quite sure what the next steps are for the climate action committee uh, or climate action adaption plan and when council will have the opportunity to review it. Um, however, yeah, that's my update. Thank you, Commissioner Sufi. Okay, we are at 9.03. Um, I would propose we don't talk about the long range calendar. Next time I'll come with an update uh, and that way we don't have to vote on extending, but we do need, uh, unless anybody wants to object, we can then motion to um, end the meeting. To adjourn. I'll second that. All right, we have, uh, let's call the vote. Um, Commissioner Sufi. 
before we do the vote, I just want to um, thank Councilman Carson for his service. Um, you've made the city a lot better place, so thank you. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, he's gone. Well. Oh, he's gone. All right. Well, still for the record, uh, uh, Councilman Carson uh, has had a major impact on the Budget and Finance Committee, Finance and Budget Committee over the years, and I have enjoyed working with him while during my tenure here. All right. Any, any uh, we'll go back to calling the the yeah, Sorry for that. I should have said that before I made the motion. It's all good. Uh, Commissioner Subi, did you? Sorry, did you? Okay, you can you do, can you touch it? Hi, thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Gus. Hi, Commissioner Jacobs. Hi, Commissioner Neville. She's hi. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Sandino. Aye. Commissioner Beeman, aye. Uh, unanimous, thank you so much. See you uh, in a month. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Stop the recording.